Now let's look at the relationship between the complete homogeneous symmetric functions and monomial symmetric functions, and the relationship between the power sum symmetric functions and the monomial symmetric functions. So recall that the HK, which I'll write out, is the kth complete homogeneous symmetric function that's a sum over indices i1 through i k which are weakly increasing of monomials of the form x i k xi1 through xik. And we define if we have a partition lambda with L parts, h lambda equals h lambda 1, h lambda 2, etc. up to h lambda L. So the question is, how do we express the homogeneous symmetric functions in terms of the monomial symmetric functions? Monomial symmetric functions being the most natural basis of lambda n. Now, if little lambda is a partition of n, then h lambda belongs to capital M to N, homogeneous degree N symmetric functions, because, well, H lambda 1 is homogeneous of degree little lambda 1, H lambda 2 is homogeneous of degree little lambda 2, and then if we add all the degrees together, if they all add up to N, then that puts H lambda into the, the space of degree N symmetric functions. So we could ask, how does H lambda expand in the monomial basis? Of the Z module. Lambda N. And the expansion is pretty similar to the elementary expansion. We have h lambda equals a sum over, let's say, n lambda nu, lambda mu for the coefficients this time, m mu, where n lambda mu equals the number of rho semi-strict Young tableau of shape lambda and content mu. So again, mu one ones, mu two twos, mu three threes, etc. Rho semi strict means that the indices weakly increase in rows. And I'm using shape lambda, whereas I use shape lambda transpose for the elementary symmetric functions to make certain formulas come out nicer in the future. I could have done, I could have made these shape lambda transpose. I could have made the other ones shape lambda. But um, it's convenient to have the elementary tableau will be shape lambda transpose and the, these homogeneous tableau will be shape lambda. And now we've got a condition in rows but not in columns, whereas before we had a condition in columns and not in rows. 
All right, let's, say, let's do an example for n equals 3. So h3 is something m3 plus something m21 plus something m111. And now we draw a tableau of shape 3. So if we put three ones in there, well, there's only one way to do it. And this is row semi-strict, so there's one way to do that. If we put two ones and a two in there, I guess there's only one way to do that. It has to be in the order one, one, two. And then if we put a one, two, and a three in, well, there's only one way to do that. If we want this to be weakly increasing as we go to the right in the row, we have to write 1, then 2, then 3. So h3 equals m3 plus m21 plus m111. Now let's look at H21. So that's something M3 plus something M21 plus something M111. According to the formula, we draw a young, tab, a young diagram of shape 21 and then fill it with three ones in such a way that the rows are weakly increasing. We can do that. Or two ones and a two. That works. That works also. All we need to worry about is the first row has indices that weakly increase as we go to the right. And I think those are the only options because if we put two in the other position here, we'd have two, one, and then the first row would not be weakly increasing. And if we have a one, a two, and a three, we could put one and two down there, three above or 1 and 3 in the first row and 2 above, or 2 and 3 in the first row and 1 above. So there's three ways of doing that. So I guess H21 equals M3 plus M21 plus 3 M111. Now how about H111? So this is something M3 plus something M21 plus something M111. If we draw a tableau of shape 111 and put three ones in it, there's exactly one way to do that. If we try and put two ones and a two in it in such a way that the rows are strictly incre are weakly increasing, then we've got three different places we could put the two. The row condition is really vacuous because every row only has one cell in it. So there's three ways to do that. And then if we want to put a 1 and a 2 and a 3 in there in such a way that the rows are weakly increasing, again, the row condition is vacuous if there's only one cell. So there's six ways to do that, just all the permutations of 1, 2, 3. So that means that H111 equals M3 plus 3M21 plus 6M111. So if we write down as a matrix what we just decided, then H3, H21, H111 equals 111. 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 6, M, 3, M, 2, 1, M, 1, 1, 1. Well, it's not obvious that this matrix is invertible. The determinant is 12 plus 3 plus 3 minus 2 minus 9 minus 6 which is plus 6 minus 6 cancel 12 minus 11 is 1 so it's invertible and it's even invertible over the integers
Unfortunately, I can't see just by looking at this how if we do partitions of four, partitions of five, partitions of six, how we're always going to get a matrix that's got determinant one or minus one. Well, it's always good. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not obviously invertible over the integers. So we can't say using this argument that the homogeneous symmetric functions form a basis of lambda n. So the set H lambda, lambda partition of N, we can't say that that forms a basis of lambda N. We will soon, but what we can't say it yet. So let's look at power sum symmetric functions. So PK is defined to be the sum of all variables to the K of power. And we can define P lambda if lambda is a partition which has L parts. to be p lambda 1, p lambda 2, etc., up to p lambda l. So since monomial symmetric functions form the most natural basis of the, the, the z module of, of homogeneous degree n symmetric functions, we could ask how did the, how did the um, power sum symmetric functions expand in that basis? And we have let's write L lambda mu for the coefficient of M mu and the expansion of P lambda. So the coefficients are L lambda mu, where L lambda mu equals the number of rho constant Young tableau of shape lambda and content mu. So for example, well, P3 we know is M3 because all the monomials have the exponent just 3. So P21 equals something M3 plus something M21 plus something M111. So we draw a Young diagram of shape 21. We want to fill it with three ones so that the rows are all constant. No increasing, no decreasing. The rows have to be all constant. Well, there's one way to do that. And if we fill them with two ones and a two, then I guess there's one way to do that. The two ones have to go in the, the row of length two. And then if we want to fill it with a single one, a single two, and a single three, we're going to have a hard time making that row of length two be constant. So there's no ways to do that. So P21 equals M3 plus M21. So if we write P111 in terms of the monomial symmetric functions, it'll be something M3 plus something M21 plus something M111. I 
I guess any way we put numbers into a tableau of shape 111, since there's only one box per row, is going to be row constant. Well, there's only one way to put three ones in there. And if we put two ones and a two, there's three ways to do that. And then if we put a one, a two, and a three, there's six ways to do that. The proof that this formula holds, I'm going to leave for you guys to do for homework. And if we write down what we just decided, P3, P21, P111 equals M3 plus, plus 0. P21 is M3 plus M21. And then P111 is M3 plus 3, M21 plus 6, M111. This matrix has determinant 6. So this matrix is invertible over the rationals, but not over the integers, because 6 is not a unit in the ring of integers. It is in the ring of rationals. That's fine. So we're going to conclude, after you do your, your homework problem, that the power sum symmetric functions form a basis of degree n symmetric functions tensor with the rational, so with, with rational coefficients. The end. <laughs>